Hello. Hello. Is this working? Yeah, yes. Yeah? Yes. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Namaste, everyone. Oh, my name is Shragi Basnet, and you can see my name on the screen. I'm here with my friend Maya Gurung. Uh, we're all in blue shiny jacket over there. <laughs> uh, we're a team of women, and we're from Nepal, and we've been going around the world, climbing mountains since 2007. Uh, when I tell my audience that we're a group of women, we're from Nepal, we climb mountains, the usual response more often is like, of course you're from Nepal, you're gonna climb mountains. Because <laughs> that's what we're famous for to the outside world. We've got the Himalayas. But if you look at the map of the country, we're Himalayas up north, and then we've got the mid hills, and then we've got flat plains down south. So the southern part of Nepal is completely flat, we share open border with India. There is nothing related to mountaineering or even hills. So we're a very diverse country. We're more than 90 languages, more than 100 ethnicities. Uh, we go as low as maybe 100 feet above sea level, and we go all the way to the highest point on the planet. So within that mix, it's very, very rich in whatever you can imagine, from ethnicity, language, flora, fauna, every single thing. So what does that mean for me? or Maya, or my teammates who grew up in Nepal. Uh, basically, that means in this South Asian context of, of a developing country, mountains were very close to us, but the mountains represent more like dreams. They're so close, yet so far away. Uh, for us, mountaineering was not something that uh, any of us could imagine doing easily when we were growing up. So before I take you through some of my mountaineering journey, a little bit about some of my friends. This is more fun picture of my team. This is Mount Kilimanjaro. And um, this friend stretching her hand out, her name is Asha, and she's from the southern plains of Nepal, so very close to India. And Nepal has been a sun preference society for various reasons, social, economic, and religious. In her family, there were six girls, born one after the other, because her parents really wanted a boy. And then the seventh was a boy, and then her parents were like, hooray, no more babies. So, Asa was number four out of the six girls born into that family. And apparently, she was considered ugly. So whoever saw Asa thought that she was not pretty as a child, and they were worried that when she grew up, it would be very difficult to find her a decent guy as a husband. And her grandmother looked at her and said, they're right, this one's not good looking. So the only solution Asa's grandmother could think of was to get her educated. So this was a blessing in disguise. Asa's younger sisters, they were married, they had kids in their teen years. Whereas Asha, she is 30 now, she got married about two years ago. Uh, she's the first person, male or female, to climb Mount Everest from the southern plains of Nepal. Uh, she has already completed her undergrad in social work. She's pursuing her master's in sociology, and she's climbed the highest mountain in six continents. So whoever thought Asa would not be looking up to a bright future, we just like to tell them, beat that. <laughs> Next to uh, Asa, that's me in the picture. And uh, next to me, that's Maya pointing her finger towards Kilimanjaro. Uh, she comes from this district, which is only four hours drive from Kathmandu. Uh, unfortunately, Sindhu Bajrup, her home district, has been infamous as a hub of road trafficking since at least the 80s. So she's seen this problem from very, very close quarters. When she was 14, her father arranged a wedding for her. And on the eve of the wedding, Maya stole 15 daughters and ran away from her home. Because she was uh, like, I'm born for bigger things than getting married at 14. Um, for two days, she didn't tell the cops where she was from because she was like, today is my wedding, I'll tell you tomorrow. When she was brought back by the cops, um, she told her father she wanted to go to school and her father told her that she was dead to him because she ran away from this wedding and it was a disgrace to the family. So he cut ties with her. In fact, he performed her final rituals when she was 14. So that's why she doesn't have much pictures of her childhood. Um, so from a young age, obviously, she had to live a very strugglesome life. But Maya being Maya, she tried her hands at everything, from singing to fashion designing to starting a restaurant to keyboard lessons. There's nothing Maya has not tried and pretty much failed at everything. 
And in 2006, when she decided to pursue mountaineering training, even the supportive side of the family, they were like, what kind of a woman just goes up climbing? Why don't you do something decent with your life? Yeah. They did not speak to her. Uh, she went for the training anyways. And in 2010, she became the first female to climb Mount Everest from her ethnic community and also from her district. And after we, she climbed that mountain and uh, we arrived at the airport from Himalayas, the biggest group of people to welcome us at the airport were her people. Uh, after the earthquake, we're supporting schools in her village. We're also working with uh, survivors who happen to be from the same district. So now we get people, especially men, who bring their daughters to our office so that their daughters can meet Maya and they request Maya to make their daughters like her. So from a disgrace, to a role model, Maya has come a long way. And I think that journey also tells us how difficult access of mountaineering is for young Nepali women. In my own case, uh, when I was little, education was not a challenge. I was born in Kathmandu, I got to go to school, my mom was educated, so very independent, bold, never a problem for me. But even for my bold, independent mom, her best definition of successful life for me was to be married in my early 20s have a job, have children. And when I told her I wanted to do bigger things, I wanted to travel the world, um, maybe speak to people like you, um, she just would politely remind me that uh, government job is the only way of success in life. <laughs> so that was her dream for me. I was 24 and if you're guessing, that was 10 years ago. So if your math is good, I'm 34 now. <laughs> So she told me it was time to get married and go for a government job. And I asked her, can I have three years of my life before I get married? And she became emotional, so she said, okay, you have three years before you get married. Uh, growing up in the school I went to, education was good, but there was absolutely no sports for girls. Nothing, there was, it was a taboo for us to be physically active. So my secret childhood dream was to be physically active. I wanted to run, I wanted to jump, sing, dance, whatever, just to use my body especially be in the outdoors. I started working as a journalist after I finished my school. So here, my mom's telling me I have to get married and I still haven't lived my childhood dream. I was craving for a big opportunity and that's when this fell into my lap. This is first inclusive women's Sagarmatha expedition. Sagarmatha is the Nepali uh, name for Mount Everest. Uh, the two gentlemen um, in this picture, Dagu Sherpa and Jenny Sherpa, they came up with the idea of organizing all Nepali women's expedition to Mount Everest. Uh, the reason they did this is because till 2007, only seven Nepali women had climbed Everest. Out of the seven, two had already passed away. So out of the five, either they would be traveling because of the nature of our jobs or they would be settled abroad. So when a group of people, maybe like you, visited Nepal and said, hey, can we meet a Nepali woman who's climbed Everest? It was practically very, very difficult. So these men wanted to bring a change and they wanted to encourage more Nepali women into mountaineering. So they organized this expedition and we all came to know about it from different sources. We became a team of 10 women led by two Sherpa men and we decided to go climb Everest. Now, for somebody who's never played sports, nothing, to think of, can I climb Everest? It was very daunting and when I looked at the mirror, I didn't see an image of a climber. So. I asked these guys, um, how do you decide if I'm going up for Everest? And they said we'd be sent for 45 days of intense mountaineering training. Mm. If we pass this training, we can become members. And then we'll be put through even longer training program, preparation program. And I said, well, I got nothing to lose. Let me go to the mountains, learn something. And if I like it, I can probably become a member of this expedition. So I signed up for this training. <laughs> Not knowing what I had signed up for. We started from the most basic stuff, how much water to drink, how to eat, what to, how to walk, how to put on your crampons, the most basic stuff, all the way to ice climbing, all the way to rescuing your friend, rescuing yourself. We would literally be put into crevasses and we'd have to rescue ourselves out. So very intense mountaineering training for 45 days. Uh, this is probably the toughest thing I ever did, ever in my life. Uh, when I started, I used to be so slow. 
I used to take forever to complete even the morning run because this is somebody who had never ran even at sea level. Here I have to run at 4,000 meters. So I would be the last person to complete my run and everybody started clapping when I arrived. So slowly everybody started calling me the Prime Minister because I was late everywhere. So, so it was very motivating and encouraging environment. By the last day of the training, I remember only seven people got up in the morning to run and I was one of them. And I was able to catch up with everybody else. And I learned that I had the aptitude to be in the mountains. I knew that I could do it. I remember this six feet tall friend, um, basketball player, he had a climbing gym at his home. Uh, the first day he was asking me questions like, oh, you think you can make it? Even before we reached our first camp, he got altitude sickness and I didn't. <laughs> and that's how my first myth was busted that you need to look a certain size or have a certain kind of background to be a climber, you don't. Climbing is a game of lungs and legs. If you train hard, if you work hard, and if you respect your lungs and legs and the nature around you, then anybody can do it. It's, it's not a size thing. Um, so there were many myths that were busted. We kept going. I remember the first day of the rock climbing session, I picked the easiest route up and I couldn't climb it. As a journalist, as a student, I was always good. I never failed in my life. Here, I could not go up the easiest section. And as I was trying to come down, I was thinking, this is so embarrassing. I'm trying to climb Everest. I can't even complete a rock climb. And I have four other women at that time in that session. And I was thinking, oh my God, these women are gonna keep me up alive. Because growing up, you're always told that women are women's worst enemies. So I was thinking, oh my God, how, what are they gonna say? I was very embarrassed. And I remember the minute I descended down and my feet touched the ground, these women uh, surrounded me and they were like, oh, Charlie, next time, just keep your spine spread straight. Don't uh, put the rope in the left or right, put it in the center, avoid the left ledge. They wanted me to be successful. And that's when my myth that women are women's worst enemies was completely busted. Women can build each other up. And that moment I decided whether I climb Everest or not, I want to be with these people all my life. And I'm still with Maya and the rest of my team. So that's how my journey started towards Everest. We finished that training, we returned to Kathmandu, and then for months we had at least four hours of training every single day. We had long hikes. We started with uh, carrying five kilos of weight and then we kept going on to 20, 30, 40, 50, even more. So that's how we prepared. Apart from all of that, in 2007, for a team of 10 women to climb Everest, we also needed something much bigger. This is my attempt at showing you what. We needed to climb a mountain of money. We needed $200,000 and all of us, we come from very middle class to low income families. We don't come from business families. We don't come from political families. We're not celebrities, so nobody knows about us. When we went around telling people, hey, we want to climb Mount Everest and uh, we've been training, we are very good leaders, can you support us? And people would be like, bravo, high time Nepali woman wrote dimensions and go with that ceiling, all of that. And when we said, oh, could you write us a check? Then they would be like, oh, but your hands are small. <laughs> or what do your parents say? Uh, they would say, uh, Everest is big, you're small. They would say that this was a very ambitious, over ambitious project, uh, lots of things. There are people who bet that at least two or three of us were gonna die. And there are people who said, claimed that not more than one or two of us would make it. Uh, we kept going, we had the government of Nepal support us, we had the United Nations support us, and then as it turns out in the fundraising world, once you have a big name behind you, everybody else wants to follow. So we had more supporters come in. Uh, we kept trying hard and we said, we'll work hard and we'll let Everest decide if we're good enough for her or not. So we kept training and in mountaineering, if you look at the history, uh, Edmund Hillary and Tenjing Norgi, when they climbed Everest, they were team B. Team A could not make it and then team B was sent up. There were hundreds of men in this one big team. So you don't look at it and think that, oh, only two men made it. You look at it and say, oh my God, you can, humans can climb Everest. Junko Tabe, when she climbed Everest in 1975 as the first female to do it, 
there were a team of 15 Japanese women and she was one who made it. So she made something possible for female. It's not like only one made it out of 15. So we had our heroes and we said we'll follow the same definition of success. Even if one person from our team makes it, we're successful as a team. That's the definition of success for us. With that, we raised funds and then our real journey to Everest started. This is us uh, trekking in the Himalayas. You take a flight from Kathmandu to Lukla for about 25 minutes and then you're on your foot the whole time. We trek for about 10 days, get to the base camp of Everest. When we arrive at the base camp, uh, we don't always hang out in this bulky gear. There's a special day where we have this worshiping ceremony. Uh, because in our culture, we believe that mountains are where gods reside, and mountains are gods themselves. So when we arrive at a base camp of a big mountain, there is an elaborate worshipping ceremony, which is called puja in the Bali language. <laughs> so here we're worshipping all of our gear and seeking permission from Everest to accept us. Once that is done, there is this spiritual bonding within the team and this connection with Everest, mm -hmm. and then we go for the real climb. Now, this is the climbing map of Everest when you're seeing it from Nepal. The lowest camp obviously being base camp. In Australia, you think in meters or feet? Meters. meters. Okay, we think in meters too. Uh, I'm married to an American, so I have to switch between meter and feet sometimes. Um, I try to tell him uh, that feet is for humans, meters should be for mountains. <laughs> We're still uh, not decided on that one. So base camp is 5,300 uh, meters roughly. We get here 10 days of uh, trek. We rest here for a couple of days. In high altitude, when you say rest, it does not mean taking a nice afternoon nap. It means you're active, you're training all day, but you don't gain elevation. Even if you go higher, you come back and sleep in the same elevation. So a few days of rest, then we go to the first camp, 19,500 feet, which is like 6,000 meters. We spend two nights there come back to base camp, rest for a couple of days. We go to the second camp, two nights there, 21,000 feet, which is around 6,400 meters, and then come back to base camp, rest for a couple of days. If your team has time, energy, resources, then you might want to touch the third camp, about 7,000 meters higher. Um, our team skipped that because we didn't have enough time, so we did two rounds of acclimatization, which is standard. And then you come back to base camp, you take a longer break here so that you recover, you recuperate. Uh, the best time to climb Everest is the month of spring in that hemisphere, so which is uh, April, May. So April, you're doing all of this rotation. Sometime in May, you look at the weather forecast, you pick your summit target date, and you set up for the summit uh, push. So you have to leave from the base camp about four days in advance to get to the summit on your target date. It takes three days to come back. So final, final summit push is four days up, three days down. Once you pack up your base camp, the nearest airport is three days walk back. Mm -hmm. So the entire expedition usually takes about two months time. 60 days is the standard time. For us, from Kathmandu to Kathmandu in 2008, it was 45 days. When I say 45 days back in 2008 to climb Mount Everest, it also means 45 days of no shower. <laughs> so you should be very happy you're meeting us now. <laughs> this is Kumbu Ice Fall. Uh, I could go on and on and on about all the difficulties and challenges of this section. I hire slopes on Everest. It just is very dangerous. You have to be very, very careful. You don't want to be caught in the middle of the mountain um, in the middle of the day, especially a section like this, because this is very fragile. You can see there are big ice bodies, boulders, in 2014, a similar section came falling in the, uh, the ice fall and 16 people perished on site. And these were very experienced <coughs> climbers. So it's not just about experience and skill, it's just a very fragile system. You want to be very careful and quick here. There are a lot of crevasses um, and all of these aluminum ladders and ropes are set up by an elite team of climbers called uh, Ice Fall Doctors. That's because every spring Everest gets about 30 climbing teams. So it's gonna be a mess if everybody tried to set this up themselves. That's why this is done. And as climbers, we're supposed to respect this. Once the ice fall doctors are done, then we go up and down. A very famous ice fall joke, which I must share here, is that when you're crossing something like this, and there are say eight or nine of these aluminum ladders, on each rung, you have to balance with your crampons, 
So you're trying to have that center of gravity, that balance. You don't want to kind of tip over and you're taking one step at a time. When you get to the middle of this crevasse, it kind of swings. You feel the bounce. And uh, famous ice fall joke, our Sherpa guys, they're like, do you know where to land if you fall from here? We're like, no. And they go, you'd go straight to New York without a visa. <laughs> Just in case, if you're interested. <laughs> That's the first camp on Everest, those are the other tents. The mountain in front at the center, that's Mount Lutze, that's the fourth highest mountain in the world. We approach the base of that mountain, we keep going. This is the second camp on Everest, and then this is the body of Everest. It's very steep, so it gathers very little snow and ice. That's Mount Lutze, the fourth highest, and on this ice pack, the top, there's our third camp. We get up here. For me, the most frustrating part of this entire journey was that one. Because this is the only camp where you get up in the morning, get outside your tent, you look up and you're like, oh, that's the next camp, I can make it. Because the aerial distance is very short, it's just there. But then it's all vertical, you keep going. 2008, I wasn't any taller or bigger. And your one step or stride at a time is all the superpower you have. And you keep going on and on and on and on forever and those yellow tents just don't get any bigger. So it was very frustrating. I was going up and you need very strong calves for this because you have to hit really hard with the front points of your crampons. Um, and when it's uh, during the day, it's scorching hot. Um, you're exposed to the sun very harshly here. Uh, I remember running out of my water very quickly. So I'm thirsty, my throat is parched and I'm craving like I just need a little bit of water. And Maya was walking maybe 20 feet ahead of me. And at one point she stops, she turns around and she goes, Shiny, yeah? And she goes, do you know what I saw in my dream last night? What? Now there's a traditional sweet, Indian and Nepali sweet, which goes like orange in circles. It's called jeli in Nepali language. It's just sugar. And she says, in my dream, there was a shop at camp two and they were selling jeli and I ate two of them. <laughs> And I was thinking, Maya, you're silly, you're stupid. Now in retrospect, that really helped. I think as a team, we're together, whenever we're going through something tough, either we were making the other person laugh, uh, we would inspire, we would help, uh, we'd say something silly, distract each other from the pain and sort of help each other out. So that really helped to keep focused on the mission. We made it to the third camp, then we are on bottled oxygen. Next morning we go up and this is a rock hill. We have Blue Cross. It's called Geneva Spur and from here we can see the ridges, the dance of clouds, all of that. We keep going ahead. This is the last camp on Mount Everest. If this is Lhotse, the fourth highest, and this is Mount Everest, the two kind of make a saddle here. So this is almost 8,000 meters. And um, in the walls, there are only 14 mountains that go above 8,000 meters. And out of those 14, eight are in Nepal. This is almost 8,000 meters, maybe 30 meters shy, which means when you're standing here and the clouds have cleared, even for a person as tall as me, you're not flying, but now you have to look down to see the mountains. It's crazy. <laughs> it's mind blowing, really beautiful. But this is not the time for sightseeing because this is the only camp where we don't spend a night. This is when we start for the summit. So sometime around 10 in the evening, we push for the summit. This is how we gear up for the summit. <laughs> Crampons, the heavy gear, oxygen mask, regulator, mittens, everything. Um, below here, if there is a mistake, there is a health issue, one or the other, you could still probably figure something out, recover, get somebody to help you. Um, there are options. From here onwards, the popular saying is one miss, game finish. Uh, here, it's not just about success and failure. It's, it, the risk could mean life and death because if this is so high, nothing is supposed to live your survive here for much long. We're all just visitors for a few hours over here. So the risk is really, really high. Uh, we keep going up throughout the night and this is one of my favorite pictures get to a point where everything is below you. The mountains, the cloud blanket, the horizon, sun is coming from below you. When we started, this was the most dazzling night sky I've ever seen in my life. The 
stars appear like somebody had stretched those twinkles super big and the moon was the brightest proudest i've ever seen and when all of that reflects in the snow it's glowing from both ends so it's a beautiful beautiful twilight you keep going and then you see the crack of the dawn uh, at one point you can see the horizon shifting into day but the night sky is still above you so you dance, see the dance of day and night at the same time it's very very beautiful gorgeous you keep going but then when you look up you don't even see the summit of everest <laughs> all you see is this ridge and you don't know where the summit of everest is so you just trust yourself that it's going to be there eventually you keep going throughout then you come to hillary step one of the last technical sections if you fall on the right it's tibet if you fall on the left it's nepal so our joke is like our body is like international border better not to pick sides <laughs> keep that balance you keep going up and then finally the far end of this picture where people are gathered that's the summit of mount everest uh, this is the highest point on the planet obviously very beautiful i was there on 24th of may 2008 this is the view towards tibet you don't see any human movement, civilization, nothing. All you see is nature, mountains, clouds. This is the view towards Nepal. And when you see this, I was maybe able to comprehend a little bit why our cultures regard mountains as gods, because if there is some force that needed a place to dwell, this would be it. It's very, very powerful and blissful. This is me on the summit around eight in the morning. And the fun was I was there with my friend Asha, the girl from the Flatlands, number four out of the six girls, yes. being the first person, male or female, to represent the Tarai Nadis of the country. We're together on the summit. This is Maya, who made it two days before us on 22nd of May, 2008. Um, she was there with other friends, Pujan. Um, a lot of people always, they're like, oh my God, you've achieved so much in your life and everything. And we're like, not really. This is our friend who was 17 when she climbed Everest. She makes us feel like, what have you been doing? We tease her that um, she went up Everest at an age when she didn't even know which bus to catch to go to downtown. <laughs> she was there with Sushmita and Naam Kuti. This is my friend Pema Diki. We're together on the summit. And this is my friend Chunu Shrestha. So remember there was a lot of apprehension about a women team going up to Everest and many thought we were going to die or not be successful. And even for us, success meant at least one person on the summit. Eventually, by 25th of May 2008, out of the 10 of us, all 10 reached the summit of Everest. And that makes us the most successful women's team to have ever been on Everest. So we're like, hooray. We came back and maybe we got a little full of ourselves. And we said, why stop now? So we said, let's climb the highest mountain in each continent. Out of the 10 from the original team, nine of us wanted to continue. So we came to Australia first. If this looks familiar, Kosciuszko. Um, very small mountain. <laughs> For a team of women from a developing country, now led by ourselves, I was the leader of the team, as the coordinator, to come all the way from Nepal, uh, climbed this mountain, we visited seven schools, we were interacting with media, we spent a month here. Um, it was a small climb, but a giant leap for us, borrowing Neil Armstrong's works. It was a very successful first international climb. And then we went to Russia. Uh, we were successful in climbing this one too, but this is where reality kicked in. We thought because we're planned Everest now, everybody would be signing us checks. No, <laughs> doesn't happen that way. We took up some loans to be on this mountain. So when we came, returned to Nepal, uh, it was a long gap of two and a half years because uh, we could not raise more funds. Two members quit the journey. We didn't know what to do. 2011 was a very, very low depressing year for us. We had no way out. And then we said, maybe like what we do on the mountains, if we just keep one feet in front of the other, maybe something will happen and maybe we can make something out of this. So. We tried to continue. Eventually, after two and a half years, we're in Kilimanjaro, the highest in Africa. So this is the seven of us together with sisters from South Africa and Tanzania. So it was not just us, it was African sisters together with us. So this was really, really worth it. We climbed this one and next we were in Argentina to climb the highest in South America. Uh, this is one climb where 
I had a frost nip. I could see the summit. I was only two hours from the summit, uh, but I had a frost nip. Maya was having some health issues as well. So three of us decided to turn around and four of our teammates made it. And we stayed with the same goal. Even if one of us completes this mission, we're successful as a team. So the same four girls made it up on Denali. This is the highest in North America. This is in Alaska. And after we climbed this, uh, the US government organized a welcome program for us and we're invited to the White House. And the Secretary of the State at that time, Joan Perry, met with our team. So this is more of a show off picture. <laughs> and uh, this really changed, like the US government uh, did not write us a check, but to have this audience in the White House, people suddenly started being nicer. <laughs> so the game changed a little bit and uh, it was very encouraging. And we said, well, we're the most ordinary group of women from a developing country. All we did was to put that one feet in front of the other, both on the mountain and off the mountain. If that can make some noise in power centers of the world, then maybe we should not stop. So we continued with our mission. The last climb was Antarctica. The four women in the background, these are my teammates. Uh, this is 2014 December, highest point in Antarctica, Vincent Massif. So if you've been counting personally, I've been on the highest point of four continents. Maya has been on the highest of five. Uh, three of our teammates, they completed the mission and have been to the highest point in all seven continents. So as a team, that makes us the first women team in the world to climb the seven summits. So we're again like, hooray, <laughs> not a good moment. Unfortunately, we completed the mission, came back with a big high. This is January 2015, we returned to Nepal. And in March, April, April 25th, um, Nepal had a big earthquake. Uh, 26th of April was when we were supposed to celebrate the closure of the seven summits, but that never happened. We had this earthquake and Maya's home district was the worst hit, most people died there. All 600 schools were destroyed. Uh, this is one of the schools that was destroyed and this is how we rebuilt it, the semi-permanent infrastructure. And slowly over time, we started realizing that uh, trafficking was again spiking. Uh, children didn't have a safe place to return. So we decided to continue supporting schools in her area for longer. Uh, this is one of the schools we've rebuilt, uh, very close to Maya's home. So now instead of doing semi-permanent structure, we're doing these permanent beautiful schools. Our next challenge is to now have quality education in these centers because it's not like before the earthquake they're having amazing education. There was lack of good quality education. That's why there are problems of trafficking, migrant labor, all of that. So we're now building schools and then making sure there is quality education here. This is one of the schools we're currently supporting. As we speak, kids are still going here every single day for education. And these are first, second, third graders. Uh, the school lost its land completely in a landslide triggered by the earthquake. So we've been able to acquire some new land and get the locals uh, and the construction has started. So this is what we're trying to build here. So Maya and I are co-leading efforts to rebuild some of the schools in our village. Uh, fortunately, we've had some great friends, Hollywood celebrities. Interestingly, three of them are Australians, Joel, Boyana, and Margot, uh, also Keanu Reeves. So their foundations have provided some support and um, Australian government um, welcomed us in 2010 at their ministry uh, to help us share our story. Uh, Nepal government obviously has been helpful. The US government has also been encouraging and we have had some uh, international media support our work uh, in and help us spread the word. So it's been a great journey. Apart from all of the work that I mentioned, we've also been training a group of young women. They are survivors of trafficking. We've been doing this for over three years now. We were supposed to train these women for a period of maybe five, six months so that they could do a trek. And then we realized that these were amazing young women in their early 20s, late teens, who were trafficked to brothels in India uh, the one we work with, the youngest, she was 12 when she was trafficked. She was promised education when they took her away. At 13, she decided to break away from this place and her cousin was trapped in the same place as well. And I remember her saying that she didn't care if she lived or died. She just wanted to get out of it and drag her last breath to Nepal. 
And that's the world we live in where a 13 year old has to make that decision. And when we started training her, we saw so much energy, power, and positivity in her. Uh, but she and her friends were trapped in jobs that just paid them $100 a month. So they were trapped in another kind of a problem. So Maya and me, we took the initiative to uh, volunteer our time so that we could impart mountaineering and climbing skills to these ladies. It was three years of not knowing where we're going, just like another mountain. Very difficult because we're not experts in this field. But um, last year in August, two of them earned their first um, license as trekking guides. And the youngest was 12 when she was trafficked. She's 21 now. Uh, we recommended her for one job and she got seven jobs from that one job. So she's really, really good. This is one of our survivor sisters. Uh, they've been in this journey and this has become our next Mount Everest to climb uh, because this is a journey that started as a personal challenge. We just wanted to climb mountains to maybe prove ourselves. And now we've learned that there's a platform where it could be life changing for young women who really, really need it. So this is what we want to do in the days ahead. We have a trekking company where our sisters can find jobs. So this is what we've been doing. And then apart from that, when I have some free time, I like to do stand-up comedy. And uh, last uh, June, July, August, I was in New York uh, just to pursue a small course in stand-up comedy. And one of the biggest comedy clubs in the United States, Gotham Comedy Club in Manhattan, uh, the producer saw me perform and he was like, I'll do, put up a show for you. And it's like, wow, I thought it's gonna be very challenging, but let's try. So I got my first big break in the United States. Um, and in February, I did my second show. Today, New York Daily News, just today have uh, released a coverage about a young Nepali woman who went from Mount Everest to stand-up comedy. So wow. <laughs> I'm starting to make maybe a little bit noise in the American stand-up scene. Hopefully I can be here again to maybe do another show or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has been an incredible journey. If you want to be part of this journey, you can go to our website, sevensummitswomen.org, or if anybody wants to come travel to Nepal, we also got people on the mountains. So we provide jobs to our survivor sisters. And whatever time Maya and I can manage, uh, we also like to support schools uh, in this remote village so that the kids don't have to think about how their future is going to look like. They can be empowered to work in their own place and make their own decisions. This has been a great journey. I have taken 35 minutes of your life's time <laughs> and we still have some more minutes for question and answer. So please ask me if you have any questions now. Thank you.